welcome everyone. You're listening to Big Sky Capital podcast. Uh, my name is Dimash. I'm the host. And our guest for today is Pedro Vieira, who's the managing partner of 500 Global. Hi, Pedro. Hi, Dimash. Thank you for having me. Yep, we met with Pedro at, in Almaty at one of the events, uh, Central Asia Venture Forum. And uh, let's start from your personal background, your education, your early career moves. I have a, a start of an entrepreneurial career that's not uh, that standard, I would say. So I started in academia. Uh, I studied engineering. And uh, my first job was as a, as a faculty at the university. Uh, I thought I was going to be a full-time university professor. And in fact, that's what triggered me going to the U.S. to do a PhD there. And then after the PhD, that's when I decided not to go full-time into academia and, and start a tech company in Silicon Valley. So that, that's how it all started. Um, my training in including the PhD is in sustainability or engineer environmental engineering. And, um, and so with that, we built a company that had a part of environmental sciences and a part of health sciences. And um, after selling that company, I started a nonprofit that helps entrepreneurs make a bridge between Portugal or East, Western Europe and Western US. So Portugal, you, Portugal, Silicon Valley to start with, but then expand to include other, other countries. And, uh, and then more recently uh, became an angel investor. And then after being angel investing for a while, um, started a, a fund in Southern Europe that invests in pre-seed and seed stage companies called Shilling Capital with a series of other um, partners in Portugal. And the last uh, of the, the, the last piece of the puzzle in this, uh, in this whole thing is a new fund in a new initiative that um, we will be pushing forward uh, in Central Asia and uh, Caucasus and Eastern Europe. So you are originally from the Portugal, right? I, I grew up in Portugal, yeah. And then I, I, I did undergrad in Portugal and then did grad school in the US. I stayed in Silicon Valley for 15 years. And now I'm back in, in Europe and Central Asia. And your way to the venture capital was founding your own uh, venture fund in Portugal, right? Yeah, so I, I initially started doing some angel investment after exiting the, the my first company. Then uh, with that, uh, I realized I wanted to do more and invest more. So I started working on uh, ways to have a, a, an institutional VC fund. Mm -hmm. And I ended up doing that with uh, with a group of angels that had been investing in Portugal for over 10 years by then, uh, or close to 10 years. And um, together, we launched Shilling.vc, which was the first institutional fund under the Shilling brand. Uh, that's a 52 million euros fund. Uh, it's been deploying capital for almost three years now and invest in companies that are pre-seed in seed stage in a tech uh, agnostic way. So invest across a multitude of verticals and, and invest in companies that have ties to Southern Europe, but, uh, but also several companies outside this region, uh, including um, a couple in, in Central Europe, UK, US, and even one in Caucasus. So... Hmm. diversity there too uh can you highlight some of the like meaningful startups uh, backed by this fund i mean you know you know what we say it's like we can't if you have if you have multiple kids you, you can't have a favorite one you like all of them um so i i do avoid that question always of like who's your you know who's your favorite but we have companies that are more visible uh, within the portfolio because of things that they've achieved so far. Uh, one of them is like, to the example of Caucasus, uh, is PayZ. So this is a company that is, uh, or was headquartered in, in Georgia initially, but then evolved to being also a Delaware company. They went to Y Combinator. 
uh, they raise significant amount of capital and they are building uh, uh, the infrastructure and the, and the final product to be the a, a, a version of Stripe for the post-Soviet countries. Uh, so that's a highly visible company that's doing really well. Uh, we've done also other things that are like deep tech companies that people don't know yet uh, much about, but that are on the leading edge of, um, of AI used, for example, for, for voice and, and image recognition and interpretation. So we have a company called Talka, T-A-L-K-A, that, uh, that's been co-founded by folks that come from teams like DeepMind and Facebook AI Initiative, et cetera. So people that five, 10, 20 years ago were leading the charge on what AI could be. And now they launched this company that's basically able to interpret your intentions by looking at you and listening to what you're saying and how you're saying it. So that's pretty cool too. But anyway, so we have more than 60 plus companies. These are just two examples to answer your question. All right, thank you. Uh, today you are the managing partner of the 500 in Georgia, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure like everyone knows what is 500, but can you explain in a few sentences what is it and how your journey started with 500? Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. So starting with 500 Global, and then we can talk about the 500 Global initiatives in, in Central Asia and Caucasus. 500 Global started 12, 13 years ago um, as, a, as an investment firm uh, with a team in Silicon Valley, uh, but with the, with the premise from the beginning that even though they were in Silicon Valley, the, in the investment activity was... Um, uh, or starting to be centered in Silicon Valley, the opportunity uh, of access to that type of capital and um, to the expertise that Silicon Valley experts had uh, was uh, spread around the world. So there's talented founders everywhere. They don't always have access to capital. They don't always have access to smart capital. Uh, and they don't have access to networks to grow their products. They don't have networks to assess investment from other inv uh, investment from other co-investors. And so, from the beginning, the the thesis of 500 Global was to invest in ecosystems outside the U.S., helping them not just with capital but also with uh, knowledge and expertise. So, training founders in those regions, giving them capital, but also training the other stakeholders in the ecosystem. So we know that it's not just enough to train the founders and give them capital. The other stakeholders like public policymakers, like angel investors, like VCs, like uh, corporates, uh, everyone in a tech ecosystem plays a role in the success of these startups. So 500 also had built from early on designed and executed a series of programs to help build up an ecosystem in its multiple parts. Um, with doing that, uh, now 500 has a family of more than 20 funds around the world, um, just a handful of them in the US and everything else is investing in, um, in regions or countries specific. Even the US funds are investing globally, right? All of these are funds <clears throat> that start, or, or most of these started as um, early stage funds, pre-seed, seed stage, pre-series A. Now we have evolved and we have grown the family to include also growth funds, if you call it, if you call it that way, or opportunity funds. Many people use many different words for the same thing, but the point is now we are a multi-stage investment company that allows us allows us to invest first with the early stage funds, but then also with funds that will follow on on that. Um, in, in the connection to, to Caucasus in Central Asia comes from, from, this, from this story, meaning that we had done these 20 plus funds around the world, uh, but we didn't have one fully dedicated to Central Asia in Caucasus. And uh, 
four years ago, roughly, um, I came to Georgia with the 500 Global team to, to do a one year and a half training program for 30 companies. Uh, the goal of the Georgian government at the time was to start positioning the country as a tech hub for Caucasus in, in um, a broader region, including Central Asia. That program went uh, really well. The results were really good. And so the government and the Bank of Georgia, who were the local partners, decided to, to do something bigger. And that's what now brings us to this version of 500 Georgia or 500 Global in Georgia uh, that we're talking about. So I, I can give you more details on that if you want. I don't know if you have a specific question about it or if I can just continue to, to give you more detail on it. Uh, in terms of the structure, you have the VC fund and the accelerator program, and the VC fund invests strictly to the alumni of the program, or that's not the mandatory? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question and something that's good clarifying. So we will we will be investing in over a hundred companies in the region for the next four years. Uh, that uh, that investment is done largely in companies that do an acceleration program that we have. We run that acceleration program twice a year, training roughly 30 companies a year. And uh, we invest in the companies that go through this acceleration program. There is some capital reserved for companies that don't go through the accelerator, but it is uh, limited and will be deployed in a very strategic way. Uh, for example, in companies that may not be at the right stage of the accelerator, but still make sense for us to, to be a part of their journey, um, but always, always for companies within the region. So always focused on uh, Central Asia, Caucasus, Eastern Europe, uh, and Baltics. Uh, how many batches uh, you already uh, passed? We with this with this new program, we've already done two batches. In fact, uh, applications for the for batch five or the third batch in this program is uh, are open. If, if everyone goes to to the five hundred Georgia program, they'll be able to to apply there. We'll and, provide uh, the link also in the description. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, I mean, a Google search for 500 Georgia will take people there, but uh, appreciate you sharing also the link in your in your channel. Um, but uh, but I was saying, yes, yeah, so applications are open. We will be selecting the companies over the summer. The, the batch starts September 24th, uh, if I'm correct. And um, it will extend until early December. So the programs run twice a year, as I was saying, they're a three months program. Uh, and uh, each, of the, each of them usually will between, trains between 10 and 15 companies. And I can tell you more details about the program later if you want also, the curriculum, et cetera. Uh, at what stages do you expect startups to apply to your program? Do you have some KPIs or maybe all just like all just the uh, subjective? Yep. So we invest in pre-seed and seed stage companies. Um, we like to see companies that, uh, well, we definitely require companies to have a, a running product. So we don't invest in just a PowerPoint idea, mm -hmm. um, but we like to see a functional prototype at least and ideally with some traction metrics. The traction metrics will, will can be measured in, in different ways, ideally also revenue and revenue growth. Um, but uh, we understand some companies are still validating some things and don't have revenue, but have other validation metrics. For example, they have growth of users and they have a highly engaged user base that shows that the product is really wanted by the market, even if it's not being charged yet or, or monetized yet. Uh, we can also look at LOIs uh, that may have been done with enterprise clients. If it's an enterprise client, if it's an enterprise uh, service, we can look at you know growth of the wait list for a certain product, if we believe that that's the true like uh, 
uh, a true wait list, if you will, because it's easy to also build wait lists that uh, mean nothing. So we can, the point is we can look at things different from revenue um, if, uh, if it makes sense on a company by company basis. We, we invest, as I said, pre-seed and seed stage. So we invest a ticket of $100,000 in, um, in then uh, in, in, in we invest that with our uh, version of a convertible note, which is the case. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the acceptance conversion rate on the previous programs? <laughs> uh, we, we, how, how many uh, startups applied in total? Yeah. We, we usually get around 400 applicants, uh, but the number is growing. 400 applicants for each cohort, and then in each cohort, only 10 to 15 make it in. In the last two cohorts, we had 12 companies and 13 companies. So 25 companies invested out of a total of roughly 1,000 candidates. Mm -hmm. that's, your, that's your ratio. Uh, what do you think that's the ideal result of the startups graduating from 500 accelerator? Yeah, so revenue or fundraising or anything else? It's it's all of the above. Um, we we so the program focuses on on several different things, and again, uh, we can go back to the curriculum because I think it's it's important for the founders who are listening to this podcast. But uh, before we go there. We what we like to see as an outcome of the program. Um, there's there's companies that are ready to start scaling internationally uh, when they graduate from the program, and we have many examples of companies that, with the help uh, that we gave them in the program, ended up expanding to multiple countries in the months that followed the program. There's companies that are already have a, a very good uh, diversified regional footprint and all they want to do at, the, at that point is to grow their revenue. So in, in those cases, we've seen companies also uh, grow their revenue quite significantly, 5x, 10x, uh, depending on the cases. Uh, and then there's companies that are also fundraising in the six months to a year that follows the acceleration program. We also have many companies, uh, most of them um, that are fundraising actively after the, the program. Uh, the metrics on that are, I, I can't disclose them, but uh, I can say that the the companies have raised many many multipliers on top of the capital initially invested meaning that they've raised money several orders of magnitude above the um, the, the initial investment that they got in the program mm -hmm. i do have some kind of stand out example startups that made the big round after the program or like 10x their revenue uh, I, I I do I, I do, but uh, because the program is so early, and mm -hmm. some of the companies are still doing some of that fundraising, the I can't disclose the names yet. But if people look at our portfolio on our site and see the logos, they'll understand uh, who who I'm talking about. Um, I think the the. The, the number, like one of the numbers that was, was made public by one of our partners, not us, in the past was that in the first programs, the first edition of the program, the companies, th that partner, which was the Bank of Georgia, invested uh, roughly $1 million in the companies. And within a year or so of graduating from the program, the companies had raised more than $10 million in total. So that's a 10x multiplier that, uh, that I was talking about. Yeah, that's a good result. Uh, in your opinion, Pedro, uh, what are the developed markets, countries in the Central Asia or Caucasus uh, that you're covering? And what are the markets, countries that are promising, like uh, developing ecosystems? Yeah. Uh, it, it, that's kind of the same thing as as the the question about the portfolio in the favorites. Uh, I, I'm investing in a very wide region. And I can't have favorite countries, but I can say that I can't and I don't want to, because I think each country has different needs, and we're gonna be able to help 
uh, each of them differently. But um, what we see is we have some some we're going to invest, like I said, focused on in Central Asia, Caucasus, and some in Eastern Europe. The in in this wide region, as you can understand, there's there's very different uh, stages of development of the ecosystem. <clears throat> so we have, on one hand, countries that have relatively large markets, uh, domestic markets, but are still quite underserved in terms of uh, tech infrastructure, uh, tech services, and um, and there I think lies probably some of the best investment opportunities because they're sort of the hidden gem. No investor is still doing anything there and uh, the companies need capital, the founders need support. Then you have another another uh, bucket of countries that ha are already uh, mature and um, they have large domestic markets, but they already have a series of acceleration programs. They already have a series of investors there. So, so the investment scene is completely different there where the founders already have enough support. And then you have anything in between do these two extremes. So we, we are investing um, in a regionally distributed way. Right now, if we look at the statistics of the last two cohorts, uh, the distribution is almost, it, it's uh, largely, or let me put it differently. In the, if you look at the last 25 investments we've done, the countries that are most, most represented are Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan. All right, uh, kind of similar question, but not in terms of the countries, but in terms of the industries. Uh, what the industries are attracted to the most venture capital and what are the, in your opinion, the promising industries that will thrive in the near future? We are talking about the you know, like Central Asia regional caucus, not in the world. Yeah, um, so the the our our thesis is that um, we need to diversify across multiple verticals. So we actually try to avoid in, in investing too too much or too high of a percentage on a specific vertical. But what we see in in this region in our region is there's a lot of uh, deep tech, AI. Web3 uh, things, which are hot sectors, hot trends these days. So we we are paying extra attention to those. Uh, we have a few examples of companies uh, that are doing um, deep tech in the area of voice recognition, uh, deep tech in the in the in the space of image recognition. Uh, we are doing companies that are doing um, a lot of things in the Web3 space. So we, we've done seri a series of investments there, but we are also doing investments across you know, other verticals like e-commerce, digital health, education. Uh, in education or ed tech, in fact, um, is, is one of the other sectors that probably I would uh, highlight as under uh fast development in the region if you will and we've done a series of investments in edtech ed tech um in fact we've done some investments in companies that are in the intersection of ai and edtech which is really cool um overall what what i see and others see um this is not just my uh my analysis is that the um, the talent, the tech, the, the, the science and technology talent in, in the region is, is very strong. Mm. The, the commercial ability to sell that science and technology still needs to improve. And so programs like ours, where during the acceleration program, we expose the founders to a lot of content and frameworks around sales and growth are fundamental to help these local companies um, monetize and grow the revenue of the deep science, deep tech that they have built over the last few years. 
So you're saying that the heart, the tech expertise, there is no difference between the founders from the Silicon Valley, for example, or other developed markets. If if we're talking tech uh, tech expertise, yes, I think there's top notch talent in the region. Uh, uh, no no questions about it, and probably better than than in Silicon Valley in some areas. Uh, the gaps are elsewhere, in my view. The gaps are on the scaling side, on the commercial side, and that's where we focus a lot of our time in our acceleration programs. Um, uh, last month, I saw uh, lots of the statements, articles that said that after raising the interest rates, the venture capital in emerging markets are di died. What do you think of that? We as the uh, VC also covering the Central Asia, uh, also feeling that. Uh, what's your statement on that? Um, I, I think so. There, there's two sides to that. One is it, it's definitely become very hard for the venture capital funds to raise their own funds. That's absolutely true. So, so you know, so managers of the funds do have a harder time fundraising um, for the deployment. Um, I I have mixed feelings about it. In our case specifically, uh, we're not slowing down. We we have our thesis set. We have our execution in place, and and we're going to continue. We actually believe that the best investments and the best funds do usually come out of times of economic downturn, uh, and there's data to prove that. So we will continue investing heavily. Uh, the the what we need to do. And again, uh, something that we work very hard with our portfolio companies is to make sure that the capital that we deploy is used in an even smarter way in terms of cash efficiency, which, to be honest, for the region is, is, a, is a relatively easy thing to do because founders in Central Asia, Caucasus, Eastern Europe uh, have traditionally, especially Caucasus in Central Asia, have traditionally lived in a cash poor environment. So they know, or capital poor environment. So they know that they need to be very wise at how uh, they manage their capital and how they manage their runway, uh, which is extremely important in, in times of economic downturn. Um, but the, the, the founders in our region have done that historically. It's not just this year or last year because they that's the reality they've lived for the last decade. Mm -hmm. And what about the liquidity for the startups, for the VCs? Is there some corporation m as activity or like possible yeah. public offerings? Uh, I, I mean, well, I don't know about the public offerings. Uh, I would say probably not. Uh, but but M and A, yes. Um, it, but it it can cut uh, to it, it can go two ways, right? Certainly, corporates that are liquid are taking the opportunity to make good acquisitions now. Good as in good valuations for them as buyer, and because some companies are uh, struggling to manage their their runway and they may they may go for an acquisition so in that sense yes there's there's uh there's a possibility of added m a even though very likely at worse term terms than it would be if the economy was pumping um so 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 the opportunity is there but on the other hand you also have you also have the ability for companies for startups that are that have enough runway that are very smart are managing their resources to thrive while other startups are dying. So for them, the M the better MA options will come in a couple years uh, once the economy rebounds and they are the only one left in their vertical, for example, or one of the few left in their left in their vertical. And for them, the exit strategies then will be more interesting than now for sure. Mm -hmm. I also men mentioned the deep tech sector. Uh, we all know that the U.S., uh, the China, even the, in Europe, the deep tech sector is like very solid. What you can say about the Central Asia and Caucasus countries in that space? I mean, as I said before, I think it's pretty solid. Um, it it has also 
the advantage that in some areas regulation is still evolving and mm -hmm. so that that what that allows for is the companies can still play an important role shaping up what the regulation should look like uh, that doesn't mean you know designing regulation that's that's not fair for everyone but it does give this ability of countries to design their new sandboxes their new regulation in a way that helps companies in these deep tech areas to to test things and and grow after that whereas if you look at for example what's happening in Europe regulation has become like a showstopper for a lot of things and a lot of companies are exploring other markets because of that mm -hmm. yeah okay um so can you give the advice for the startups at the beginning or for the startups that were not accepted to the 500 program yeah okay so two there's that's actually two questions so in terms of like the generic question of startups and what do you do at the very beginning of the journey um i i share a lot of that in the um, in the webinars that we do to to talk about the program and by the way we have one coming up uh soon or two of them coming up soon so whenever people hear the this podcast you should also check our websites for for that for information on those on those webinars but in general uh, one of the things i always say is for founders to make sure that they are starting a company for the right reasons mm -hmm. uh, and this sounds very philosophical but the after uh, so many years working with hundreds of investors around the world, what I understand is that some people have certain skill set uh, that is aligned with the company that they're trying to do and trying to build, uh, but they're not building it for the right reasons. And that doesn't mean to me that they have to be building a company to change the world. I mean, th that's good. That's very visionary. That's very aspirational and inspirational for others. Um, but some companies are built for just the sake of solving a very small problem in a very short amount of time and have an and reach a liquidity event. And that's also fine. But my point is the founders doing it need to understand why they're doing it. If they want to build a company just because it's cool being an entrepreneur, that's not going to take them anywhere. The life of entrepreneur or of a founder of a company or early stage employee of a, of a startup is, is a grind. As we say, it's not easy. It's many long hours with very low pay, with very low probability of success. It's uh, it, If you put it that way, it's a very dark uh a very a very dark prospect for the future so you have to be willing to do these things and just to say i'm very passionate about this thing or i'm very passionate about this problem blah, 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 that's you know that's very superficial we, i i like to say just really make sure as a founder you ask yourself why am i doing this why do i want to spend another 10 years of my life in this environment is it really worth it for me and then, you know, there's all the other things I can tell you about the technical aspects of becoming a good founder and whatnot, but uh, I don't think we need to go over those here because people can find that information everywhere. Um, <clears throat> that's the first question. The second question is, uh, what what should companies do when they apply to our program and what should they, what should they do if they don't if they don't get accepted the first time they do they apply so to apply to our program again check check our webinars we go through these things you know in in a very deep way so that's the best place for you for the founders to know what they need to do to have a very strong application in terms of what should you do if you don't get uh, into one of the cohorts you should most of the cases you should apply again the the i i know it sounds easy for me to say keep applying uh but the but, but there's a point to it most of the companies we see applying to the program right now which is still a new program in the region are um are not ready for the program so it's not the rejection does not mean that they're not a good founding team or they don't have a good solution or they're not tackling a, a big opportunity in the market it's more like the they're not ready. Um, the product is not ready or the team is not complete or the traction metrics are still not de there. Um, and so we try uh, whenever possible to give this feedback to the companies in the rejection emails so that 
they know what to do in the next round. Um, the other thing that uh, we recommend is for companies to also reach out to the founders that are in our portfolio and are from their countries or they can, re they can reach them easily uh, because there's nothing better than talking to these, these founders that we've trained and investing, invested in to learn what to do if you get rejected and, and how to uh, get on our radar for the, for the next version of the program. Mm -hmm. uh, I cannot uh, I cannot stop staring at the painting behind you. Are you into art or something? Um, I like art. I like design. I don't claim to be an expert. Um, this is actually a, a, a recent acquisition from a Brazilian painter. Uh, and um, interestingly enough, uh, and it's no coincidence, it's about uh, war and about the current state of affairs in, in our region. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, the last question for today. Um, do you have some kind of content diet uh, or recommendation on books, podcasts, or the news newsletter, blogs? Again, uh, I, don't, I don't want to point out my favorites. I think that these days um th there's there's a couple of blogs that are that i follow and that i think that founders should follow that mm -hmm. because of their um because they're very broad because they come cover a, a wide range of topics that are that are valuable one of them is avc from fred wilson um definitely follow it regularly um and then there's there's other guys that I read now and then, but uh, Paul Graham, for example, always writes very conceptual and then applied stuff. Um, I think the founders, uh, more than this is may sound a little bit controversial, but more than spending too much time reading, they they need to spend a lot of time building. Um, the ones that um, I see a lot of founders that are theoretical in nature, and they're very good at answering all the questions that the VCs have for them, but then the, the metrics of the companies, what they're building, the team that they hired do not reflect what they're saying in theory. So I, I think that the, 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 the saying that ideas are worth almost nothing, execution is everything, is uh is very is very dear to me very close to my heart and very accurate all right thanks a lot pedra uh for that conversation and thanks a lot for everyone listening to this podcast and if you are the founder of the seed proceed startup uh we will provide the link for you to apply for the 500 global accelerator um thanks a lot pedro Thank you so much for having me and for the opportunity to talk about 500 Global in our region.